Well, I certainly hope you're proud of yourself reading a smutty novel about a naughty woman gone bad. Um, you heard me. It's not smutty, because at that time, uh, when this novel was first published, it would have been considered quite a scandalous novel. In fact, it would have been the kind of novel that you brought home from a bookstore in a brown paper wrapper so nobody could see what you were reading. And it would also be the kind of novel that... Um, well, if you were a younger woman, and that was who this was mo mostly aimed at, um, you know, teens, 20s, or whatnot, that your mother would be shocked to see you reading it and probably come up to your room and, I don't know, take the novel away and give you a lecture and then promptly take it back to her own room and read it herself. Because it was about things that people, especially young women, didn't discuss very much, right? Um, um, adultery, um, uh, sex outside of marriage, all those kinds of things. Um, but um, the, uh, I know you're saying, where's the smut? <laughs> but uh, for, eight, for 1797, it was pretty racy stuff. Um, respectable girl finds herself seduced by a dashing military man and dies penniless and penitent. Um, um, but would it surprise you that this was one of the hottest selling novels, uh, certainly hottest selling works of literature on the North American continent in the first few years of the, um, in the last few years, I should say, of the 18th century, in the first few years of the 19th century. The book went through two editions uh, from 1797 to 1802, each edition of a book, of course, itself encompassing several printings. Editions are, are, are different versions of a book that are created because there's a material change in the text, like some, you know, writing a new introduction or um, changing some wording here and there. Printings result when you in the old days, pulled out the prints, I mean, the uh, the plates, and printed off another run, if you will, um, of X number of copies. And uh, when the first copies from the first printing are all gone, you take the plates out, you create another batch, which becomes a second printing, and so on and so forth. Issues are, are issues, that is, are, are portions of printing. So you got issues, printings, editions. So you can imagine that if it went through a couple of editions from 1797 to 1802, it was a fairly popular thing. We'll talk about the uh, you know literature in the early republic in just a moment, but back then a book would go through a lot of printings and issues before a new edition came out because new editions were a lot of work. It was it was expensive. And that's not a huge surprise. The huge surprise though, is that sales basically stopped for two decades. From about 1802 until the 1820s, it just, just weren't any more editions at all. And pro probably, in all likelihood, um, some of the old copies were still on shelves somewhere. Um, hardly any more copies were sold until the 1820s, but from 1824 to 1831, 10 more editions. Not printings, not issues. 10 more editions which would have had encompassed many printings and issues, were published. Ten more in just a seven-year space of time. And within those were all the printings and issues and all this kind of thing. Why was this renewed? Why did this novel experience renewed popularity? Um, well, let's talk about that just a little bit um, because it's, uh, it, it's quite revealing. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that mystery in a little bit, but, but you, I need you to hang with me for just a few minutes and talk about, backtrack for a moment, um, with a digression on the rise of fiction in the United States and the factors that influenced its development, okay? And a lot of this is going to end up with the Jacksonian era, as I'll get to in just a moment. But the first thing I want you to think about is, of course, the Puritan origins of uh, of American society. Now, a lot has been made of that, and I think too much has been made of that, that we're all a bunch of latent Puritans and all this kind of stuff. Well, I think that's largely hokum. But there are some bits and pieces of cultural DNA, if you will, um, from our Puritan past, even if you, like me, aren't descended from Puritans at all, or even English people. Um, uh, it, it, has, it has had an important influence in shaping the early uh, years of the country, and the early years of the country shaped the later years of the country. So in that sense, I think you can do that. So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to give you sort of a laundry list of historical influences that shaped early American literature, and particularly early American fiction. And, uh, uh, the first is that, you know, just about everybody knows about the Puritans. These folks in 1620 wouldn't have known what a novel was. Uh, the, the novel, a, a novel actually means something new, uh, by the way. And uh, the first novel in the English language, everybody debates about it. Is it is it Pamela? Is it, you know, something by uh, D uh, uh, Daniel Defoe? Is it something else? Is it Don Quixote in Spanish uh, literature? Y you, you argue about it. But we do know that the first novel that was published by an American 
in America was William Hill Brown's Power of Sympathy. That we do know, okay? Uh, but there were several others, and frankly, male novelists in the, or in the late 18th century, early 19th century, that's the period of time we're talking about, because really there weren't novels prior to that, um, were mostly female. The, the novelists were. Um, but um, Puritans largely saw um, writings that we would call novels today, Defoe, Richardson, these people, um, uh, as a waste of time, honestly. And that wasn't just something Puritans thought, by the way. Jefferson thought novels were a terrible waste of time. They thought they were trash literature. It was just junk. The way kind of a lot of us today would look at maybe comic books or something like that or, um, or you know, silly sorts of stuff. Waste of time. Um, uh, you shouldn't you shouldn't spend your time reading that. You should read instead history and poetry and philosophy and nonfiction. And, um, even drama was considered a little bit, you know, eh, uh, kind of lightweight, junky stuff. Um, um, the Puritans in particular thought, well, it's novel, it's fiction. Fiction means basically it's a pack of lies. Um, and so it's trashy pack of lies that led to uh, the corruption of the morals of young people, particularly women. And sort of this, this legacy of seeing the corruption, uh, the, the novel, that is, as corrupting or as trashy um, lived well into the 18th century, right? Um, and uh, the deep, it, these deeply ingrained prejudices against novels is something we don't really find easy to grasp. That's true. We like novels, but believe me, it was promoted um, uh, and, 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 and well-rooted um, in, in, at the time that, that we, we've got to stamp out the novel kind of thing. It's a bad influence on the youth. So that's one influence there. So that's one of the reasons why novels didn't really take off very well until much later in, in, the, in, in the U.S. than they did in, in, in England, for example. It's a full century later before you see any American novelist at all. Um, the other thing is sort of the, um, the multiracial society, or multi-ethnic, uh, if you will, probably multi-ethnic is a better term, um, multi-ethnic, to some extent multi-religious, um, uh, multinational kind of society. Think of the readers of, of, of novels like J uh, by, by Jane Austen and Charles Dickens, and you're likely to conjure up images of, say, well-educated, middle-class, upper-middle-class, socially conscious individuals. So in Britain, an affluent middle class had already emerged. Um, uh, one that had kind of a, a rather homogeneous complexion to it, racially and culturally, frankly. Um, even the earliest writers in the U.S., um, or simply those visiting the U.S., um, like de Tocqueville, for example, um, could tell you that within a few decades or at most within a century, the American reading public was going to be a much more diverse reading public than you would see back in England. Um, that's a huge difference. Think about it. It's a huge difference, and it's one that uh, a writer has to consider. Um, de Tocqueville, as I said, wrote uh, in the first years of the 1800s that the majority of upstate New Yorkers didn't even speak English. Think about that. Didn't even speak English. Talk about a sort of a multicultural, multi-faith, multi-you name it kind of country. Everybody knew from the time of the revolution on that the issue of race was going to be the defining issue for the new country. The issue of uh, multiculturalism was, a, 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 you know, in a broader sense, was certainly going to be something that the new country had to grapple with. So, so if you're a writer, how do you do that, right? Now, for us, we think, well, that shouldn't be an issue, right? But for those folks at that time, that would have been a big issue. How, who's my writing public? I, I don't. I don't know who I'm writing to. I'm, I'm writing to people who don't speak my language, who don't share my religion, who who are, are of a different ethnicity. Or how, how do you write for all this? You take a country that's already got a small population, and then you fragment it like that. And and the question of what is my audience is a really big question, isn't it? Um, the third the third area economic limitations. This is huge. With all these immigrants moving to the United States after the Revolution in particular, um, and with all those settlers free to move even farther west after the Revolution, um, you do know that that was a major reason why we had a revolution, right? We fought the king because the king limited westward expansion because he didn't want to pick an, another war with the French, any more wars than they've already had. And so the settlers were partly... Uh, if not largely in favor of independence, because what independence meant was independence from the limitations of westward expansion. So that's a huge thing. Well, after the after the revolution, um, 
all that land was free to be settled. At least that was what a lot of settlers thought. And you have this dispersion, this diffusion, this thinning out of the population. That's super important because you don't have the compactness of the society, of the, of the, of the, of the population, I should say, that you did before the revolution. In the revolution, what the revolution did was it helped build East Coast cities, right? If, it, it, because bottling all those people up meant that they had to be in urban areas because they weren't allowed or weren't supposed to be out there settling at as rapid a rate as they would after that limitation was taken off. The, the court came out of the bottle, if you will. Well, once the court comes out of the bottle, where's everybody living? Well, they're living much more in rural areas, hard to reach areas, farther out areas. That's super important because when you're farther away from cities, you don't have things like currency, as in money. Well, how do you pay for novels? Well, you don't pay for them with chickens and with hogs and with whiskey. I guess you could. Um, but you, you, it takes money. You have to have a monetized or a monetary society to do that. You don't have that. The second thing is that as people moved out like that, it took, remember what I said, that, that um, uh, it, you know there was a two-decade gap there between these first couple of editions of the Coquette and the next 10, it took a couple of decades for not only the economy to catch up with the westward expansion, it also took a couple of decades because all these immigrants coming into the country didn't speak any English. They didn't even read and write. If you moved with your family out to the wilderness, there weren't schools. There weren't churches. You might have had a copy of the Bible, but that's about the only written thing you had in your household. So an entire generation of people grew up without any formal education. Literacy rates in the early republic, the 18-teens and 20s, the 1800s, the 18-teens, the 1820s, actually dropped in the country. And it took until there was more growth and more civilization coming out that way before people began to have the ability to read and write in larger numbers. Because if you don't have literacy, you don't have a marketplace for, 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 uh, for literature, correct? So that was a major, major thing. So they needed money. You needed, and transportation, by the way. How are you going to get all these books out there? You know, you know, they didn't have Amazon, right? They didn't have Barnes & Noble. They didn't have anything like that. The, 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 the other thing, the fourth thing, is the lack of publishing outlets. Think about this. You're an American writer, you know, and, and there, there were publishers. There were publishers, mostly Boston. Boston was the big publishing hub, not New York at the time. Um, these publishing firms were not terribly well capitalized as businesses. They were mom and pops. Um, you didn't have the big publishing firms that you have now that are international. One bad novel could sink the family business, okay? So what are they going to publish? If you're in a publisher in Boston, if you're a bookmaker in Boston, etc., what are you going to publish? You're going to publish things that are tried and true. You're not going to take a risk on some unheard novelist, un unheard story writer. This is why people like Hawthorne had such a tough time. Uh, it was hard to find somebody who would be willing to publish their stuff. So Hawthorne basically starts by writing short stories, and then when he gets a following... And by the way, the short stories were published in magazines because it was easier for people to buy magazines. They were lighter weight. They were either easier to transfer out by coach, um, by by canal, by by whatever. And they could the magazines, not books, got to people on the frontiers first. And so you would publish some things in magazines, get your quick paycheck for that. And then what he did was he collected his best, his greatest hits into a book called Twice Told Tales. Now you understand why he called it that, right? Twice Told. He, he collected them together. So so th those kinds of things, we'd already talked about the declining literacy rates. I kind of jumped the gun on that one, sorry. But essentially the lack of publishing outlets because they were basically running over to England, grabbing a novelist, um, you know, uh, picking up a copy of Ivanhoe, running back to the U.S. and basically stealing it because there was no copyright law. Um, and uh, Sir Walter Scott stuff and all this kind of junk, uh, junky English novels. And, and, and printing those and, and essentially pirating those and, and printing that because it was an easy sell that could actually make some money. You take a chance on a guy named Hawthorne or a guy named Poe or, 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 or you know, that's a, that's a real risk. You could lose the family business doing that. Um, so, and then the final thing here that I want to raise is um, before I get to the sentimental seduction novel and its characteristics is class conflict. One of the things that we need to bear in mind, it's going on right after the revolution and all the way up to the 1820s, is this growing anxiety on the part of the economic elites. Now, the United States wasn't an aristocracy, but it was aristocratic-like 
in a way, because it was the colony of an aristocracy, certainly aristocratic power. And of course, the social structure after the revolution didn't just go away. It was already there. You had landed gentry, certainly in the South, that persisted a long time. You had landed gentry and powerful merchants. And these people were, there was a great deal of class distance between them and the lower classes, these immigrants and working class people, um, uh, you know, the as, as they probably would have referred to them as the ignorati. Um, um, right? There was a huge class distinction at the time, and this was very important. Um, what happens is that that upper class becomes increasingly worried, anxious, one might even say paranoid, at this rising tide of working class, um, small r, Republican, as opposed to aristocratic, monarch monarchy endorsing sort of folks, um, um, that these folks were um, the... Um, the, um, the, uh, the, they were threatened by these people, frankly, and uh, they were worried that they were going to, um, to sort of take over the country and that the, 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 the ignorant mob was going to run it. You remember that, that, that democracies or republican governments were a brand new thing. Um, you know, they were being told by the aristocratic folks in Europe, this is madness. You're going to descend into barbarism. You're going to be run by a bunch of hillbillies and hicks. Well, that sort of thing battled back and forth, and people debated it back and forth quite a bit until uh, uh, Andrew Jackson is elected. Andrew Jackson, rough frontiersman, not formally educated, frankly, not very educated at all, um, takes over the White House. And as if to sort of put an underscore uh, under the fears of the elite, um, Jackson, in his right after his inauguration, throws a huge party in the White House, and the, shall we say, the rougher crowd that Jackson hung around with pretty much trashed the place. I mean, there were there were animals, there were pigs in the in 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 the in the White House running around loose. People were jumping out the windows. There was liquor everywhere. Everybody was falling down, stinking drunk. And, of course, the people who were upper class said, Oh, my Lord, it has come to fruition. Um, and so, so you understand that there's a class conflict thing and a background here. The novel would have definitely be seen, been seen as a place to play out these sort of class conflicts between what's going on. And the debate that was happening in the first two decades of the country's existence was, what kind of country is this going to be? This is a huge experiment. Nobody knows how it's going to end. Nobody knows what's going to happen. We've seen what happened in France. We don't want that. Um, but what, what in the world is going to happen? Um, and so the end result of all of that is that the novel during the period makes a comeback as popular the popular person's fiction. So it's no coincidence that Jacksonian democracy in the 20s comes to a rise at the same time that literacy levels are rising, that popular types of fiction are rising. So you have to see it in that kind of, in that kind of sense. Um, the, um, the, the other thing to be aware of is the fact that this novel is very much in the tradition of a subgenre that we call sentimental seduction fiction. The sentimental seduction novel um, is one that you see played out. Of course, we looked at Charlotte Temple. It's very much in that tradition where you have this um, very strong um, uh, theme uh, of, of the power of sentiment, um, or as some people would say, sympathy, where the emotive aspects of the character's personalities take precedent over logic. Um, and that this is, this is actually a good thing, right? Um, it supposedly appeals to humanity, the humanity of the reader. You should feel for these women. You should feel for these characters. You should have an emotional response to it. They're trying to make an emotional connection with the reader. All that's there. But also it deals with the scandalous topic of seduction, right? Things that you're not supposed to be reading about. Your parents would be having a fit over if they found you reading it. That sort of thing. Um, and of course, the whole novel is all about basically the tension over Will they, won't they, will they, won't they, will they, won't they. Oops, they did, and now she's in trouble, okay? Um, and so that's the narrative, that's the sort of the dramatic tension involved with it. Always involves some sort of dashing young man in a uniform who doesn't have good morals. Uh, always involves a young woman who ignores the prudent advice of her friends and, and counselors, etc. And so that's exactly what you have in this particular novel as well. Falls right in line with that tradition, and there were oodles and oodles and dozens of them. What's really interesting is, is, for those of you who've read The Scarlet Letter, and I hope that's everybody, um, 
Hawthorne takes this sentimental seduction novel tradition and turns it on its head. Because the sentimental seduction novel almost always ends with the young woman dying in childbirth, or, or if she doesn't die, she joins a convent and repents and all this kind of stuff. And the man ends up, you know, sort of... Um, running off and becoming an alcoholic or something because he just can't live with himself for having done what he did to this poor girl and all, all these kinds of things. Think about The Scarlet Letter. Hester Prynne doesn't just not die. She decides to raise her own child. And she does not betray the person who, shall we say, got her in that condition. All right? There were two willing parties here. Um, but not to ruin the novel, it's he who absolutely has a mental breakdown and, and, and dies. Not her. She triumphs. She lives. Um, and she's not the one who ends up living in ignominy. In fact, the A she wears on her dress each day, they come to her and say, you, you know, it's been enough years now. You can take that off. And she says, oh, no, no, I intend to wear it for as long as I live, because that was the punishment that you doled out to me. And the villagers become embarrassed and ashamed of how they had treated her, and she wears that A on her on her breast with pride, and also she flips the punishment on them. So Hawthorne takes the sentimental seduction novel and begins it after the sex, by the way, right? The novel begins after the sex, not before. Turns it on its head, so he's working within that convention, but to do something completely radical. That's why that's a, such a great novel. Nobody ever tells you that. Mrs. McGillicuddy in fifth grade, or eighth grade literature doesn't tell you that's why the Scarlet Letter's great. But it's great partly because he takes a, a, a subgenre called the sentimental seduction novel and totally flips it on its head. And create something really interesting and really new out of it. But that's where it's coming from. All right. Next, uh, next video, we'll uh, talk a little bit about some of the basics in the novel that, that anyway, some commentary for you.